In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Dear ones, last week I uploaded a video on the life and influence in my life of one of my favorite saints, St. Methodius, the wonder worker of Aegina and Metropolitan of Pentapolis. At the end of that video, I mentioned that I had been given permission, which is a great blessing, I'm very grateful for it, to read from this book. It is volume 17 of the collected works of St. Nectarios, although this book is not the writings of St. Nectarios. It is the spiritual fruits of St. Nectarios. It is the life of the first abbess of his monastery, uh, Yoranisa Xeni, or Xenia, which is what I'll be saying, uh, and, and her own writings, poems, supplications, and confessions. So it's volume 17, available on Amazon. Uh, as I read the life of Yoranisa Xenia, uh, you'll see a picture of her. Uh, there aren't many pictures of her available online. They're not the best quality, but I do have a, a printed picture of her behind us as we read. And so, uh, for the first time published in English, I believe it was published either this year or last year. Last year, 2023, I didn't know about it until this year. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is an enormous blessing to know the life of this very holy abbess. May she be numbered among the saints, God willing. This is the life of Irarisa Xenium of Aegina who lived from 1867 until 1923. And please uh, forgive me and bear with me for some of the Greek pronunciations. The monastery of St. Nectarios in Aegina is well known to all Greeks. It is the monastery that was founded by the saint in the 20th century, together with 10 nuns who followed him from Athens. Among them, a blind Cretan girl, Chrysanthi Strugilu, stood, who stood out for, for her virtues. She was born in 1867 in Kania, Crete, during the Cretan Revolution from, for liberation from the Ottoman rule. At the age of nine months, she lost her sight due to meningitis. Her parents, Nicolaus and Maria, devout people, enlightened her with the light of Christianity. So, when the blind Chrysanthi came to Athens, she was hosted by devout families, and thanks to her spiritual cultivation, she was loved by all. She regularly went to the church dedicated to the Toxiarchis at Poligono. She wore monastic clothing. There she met Ekaterina Mathopoulou, a pious and wealthy woman who was the daughter-in-law of Father Evsevius Mathopoulou. The pious daughter frequented the same place and met St. Nicarius, who had visited Mrs. Mathopoulou's house after a memorial service. From then on, Chrysanthi and a group of pious girls had St. Nectarios as their spiritual father. They had spiritual meetings which took place at the house of Father Efsevius Mathopoulos' daughter-in-law. The hearts of these devoted women were inflamed with the desire for total dedication to God. In 1904, St. Nectarios chose a place in Xanthos, Aegina, where the Monastery of the Life-Giving Spring once stood. It was there that St. Nectarios decided to stay with the ten young women. With the spiritual clarity that characterized the saint, he appointed the blind Chrysanthi, who was later renamed Sister Xenia, as the abbess. There are oral testimonies from faithful residents of Aegina that demonstrate the remarkable life, prophetic and visionary gifts of Yeranisa Xenia, as well as the deep trust and dedication towards the saintly nun by her followers. The preserved memories are very reliable, and we present some of them as examples. She was the first abbess of the monastery, said Evangelia Bessie, a saintly woman endowed with many virtues. She applied the advice of his eminence to the letter and also helped the sisters to apply them. They all respected her. She also had a wonderful poetic talent. She was a religious poetess who wrote hymns to Christ, the Virgin Mary, and the saints. She had a beautiful soul. She was a person of God. The memories of Sotirios Economo, a student of St. Nectarios at the Rosarius School, are similar, and he emphasizes, Holy soul. I actually wonder why they didn't declare her a saint too. Petrula Votsi Gianokopoulou shared her personal experience. She was a saintly person, lovely. She also had the gift of foresight. Good morning, Giranjisa, I would say to her. Welcome, Petrula, she would kindly re respond. Anyone who approached her, without of course being able to see, even a ray of light, communicated with her as if she wasn't blind. She was charismatic. 
Particularly significant is the testimony of her niece, Maria Strongilu. When she prayed, you would think she was not touching the ground, that she was in heaven. The Aginite nun Nectaria used to say about her, she was a holy woman. Her bones exude a sweet fragrance. Many nights at the evening service, after St. Nectarios had fallen asleep, she would see an old monk with his black beanie wandering around during the service. She couldn't see at all, but she saw everything. When she entered the church, she would say, Why do these icons have dust on them, my children? One day she told me, Why are you wearing such a short dress, Zenobia, when you are planning to become a nun? Many people spent all night praying for the saint at the monastery when he was sick at the hospital in Athens. Yudhisa Xenia would walk around and comfort the crying people. In the evening, before the saint passed away, the nuns received a telegram saying that things were getting better at the hospital at Ereteo. They were happy, but Xenia was not. She had seen him in a vision in the courtyard of the monastery, and he had said to her, I came to say goodbye. I am leaving. A little while later, we learned the news that St. Nectarios had passed away. In the 136 surviving letters of St. Nectarios, around 110 are addressed to the Most Holy in Christ, Xenia. Despite her frail health, Xenia forced herself to pray and fast so much that St. Nectarios felt the need to remind her not to endanger her health. At other times, he advised her to reduce her prayers. Of course, she obeyed as she was a person of obedience and knew well what St. Nectarios would say to any nun who disregarded his advice. Keep the conditions of the Holy Schema and its laws. Xenia herself had a great sensitivity and fear of God when it came to receiving the Immaculate Mysteries. She never partook unless she received the blessing from the saint. She had deep humility, as evidenced by her reluctance to wear a new rasso, instead cutting pieces and patching it up to make it look old. She had clear discernment and admirable patience. St. Nectarios, convinced of her spiritual wisdom and, and, and understanding, wrote to her to let the sisters know that they should all confess their thoughts to her. At other times, he wrote to her saying, I don't want any of the sisters to give orders except you. By practicing the virtues and sanctifying herself, she became experienced in the principles of the monastic way of life. This is evident from a letter written by St. Methodius to Xenia for a sister, in which he reminded her of the principles of the monastic way of life. Quote, Firstly, self-denial, which is followed by the cutting off of one's own will and submission. Secondly, patience and humility, and the virtues that accompany them. And thirdly, attentiveness and discernment. End quote. He then instructs Xenia to teach these principles and the other terms of the monastic way of life to the sisters in concern. Divine Gratisa Xenia was mindful of the phrase, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force, and would force herself, as directed by the saint, to act with prudence in all things, so that faith, hope, and love towards God would be perfected in her. She listened to the words of God and the teachings of her spiritual father, and struggled to work for God and keep her mind focused on him. She also tried to inspire these same qualities in the souls of the nuns of her sisterhood, urging them to pray and be attentive. In fact, to ensure they didn't forget, she recommended that they write attention and prayer on their palms every day. The saint, impressed by her holiness, instructed her to make the sign of the cross over a sister with some holy relics. He also trusted her with the responsibility of managing the program of the monastery and even the construction of his own cell, which he built where she thought best. These are the miraculous events taking place in the spiritual realm where an illiterate woman, deprived of the natural light of her eyes, managed to lead a monastic sisterhood and promote it spiritually. The nun Xenia had a natural poetic vein and a sensitive soul that were further refined by pain and faith. She felt the need to express in verses the emotions that flooded her, her love for Christ, the Virgin Mary, the awe in, the awe in the face of the terrible second coming, the fear of her sins and the hidden pain for the deep darkness that surrounded her. The verses that her blindness inspired quiver with sighs, but are also shaken by gentle faith and soothed with the comfort that only wholehearted devotion to God can give. This is the blind poetess Xenia, 
who had deep humility, clear discernment, and admirable patience. God also granted her poetic talent. Although she is not a well-known poetess, her simple poems are like fresh wildflowers, picked from the cultivated field of her poetic nature, that compose a beautiful bouquet, which will forever preserve its fragrance, as they refer to the eternal and unfading rose, the All-Holy Mother. These words remind us of what St. Anthony the Great said to the blind theologian of Alexandria, Didymus, Do not be troubled that you lack physical eyes, the same eyes that flies and mosquitoes have. Rejoice, for you have eyes by which angels see, by which we see God and his light. Poetic treasures, like those of the blind monastic, can provide a basis for deeper reflection and exploration. They are a distant echo of the works of St. Simeon, the new theologian, and Quesarius de Pontes, a living continuation of the, other, of the religious folk verse. It is heartwarming that even in our time, we have such flowers from the solitary life, as well as such female examples beside the great saint of our era. She passed away on November 1st, 1923. So this is uh, not really a full life of Yurada Saxenia, but rather a, an explanation of her personality and her spiritual gifts. But just from that little bit and uh, that incredible story of St. Nectarius appearing to her before he reposed to say goodbye to her, and her ability to see when, when icons were dusty, despite the fact that she couldn't see, uh, you certainly get a sense that this was a, an extraordinarily holy abbess, uh, God willing, as I said, she will be officially glorified by the church. Of course, this is not our will. You know, we wait for the will of Christ in these things. We don't push our will, but uh, I, I do hope, I do hope that uh, love for her grows. Uh, I'll end uh, just by reading just a, a little bit of, uh, of one of her, her poems. Um, this is uh, just a couple pages, starting on page 86. To the Most Holy Theotokos, and you get a sense for her heart through these things. A true vineyard are you, O Mary, for you produced your most holy fruit of life. The grape cluster of divine sweetness, gladness, and life did you cultivate, O pure one without bridegroom. O untilled earth, you clearly brought forth the ear of wheat, and the giver of life did you contain in your womb. O come, all you brethren, let us magnify faithfully the pure child of God whom Christ glorified. Descending from on high, the Son of God took on the form of a servant in order to save mortal men. Oh, how meek and sweet, good and merciful, how much he loves mankind, how compassionate and merciful is he. And do not cast me out, the lowly stranger, the unworthy and naked, the condemned one. Oh, what a dread mystery, oh, what compassion, that I might partake of the body of God, I, the unworthy one. I glorify and give thanks for your goodness, your extreme condescension and holiness. For you did not bring to naught a useless woman, an unfeeling soul, stubborn and unworthy. O oh, come, sweetest Jesus, and console me. Cleanse my filth and renew me. My ailing soul, do come and heal. My pains and my wounds, O oh Christ, do cure. Your holy body and your blood, O oh my Savior, shall be the joy, the hope, and the might of my soul. From an unclean soul and an abominable heart, do favorably accept, O supremely good one, a meager thanksgiving. Just in a couple pages, you see this overflowing love for the Panagia, for Christ, and for Holy Communion. So there's a lot of beauty in this in this book. I, I do recommend picking it up. It's not long. It's under uh, just under 100 pages, but it's a, it's a beautiful little volume to have uh, to uh, to commemorate and and uh, to pray with. Uh, Saxenia, the first abbess of the convent rebuilt by St. Nectarios. May we have St. Nectarios' intercessions and, God willing, as certainly as Yonatis Saxenia uh, stands in paradise with him, may we have her prayers as well. In the words of the great saint of Romania, Elder Cleop of Sihasria, may heaven consume you. Amen.